Sorry. Sorry. Oh, right. So welcome everybody. Um, we have 61 participants. Welcome to our monthly um, West Coast Metabolomic Seminar um, series. Um, this today we do it remotely. I think we do it re for the very first time remotely, um, which is very um, fitting because our guest speaker today is a, a person who is mostly um, working in the clouds anyway. Um, he has a very active blog. He's very proud of his blog. He's uh, in interesting websites. Um, he did before, however, do real science. He did uh, received his. Uh, BA in mathematics from Reed College in 1997 and his PhD in developmental biology at Caltech in 2006. He has worked in digital evolution, climate measurements, molecular and evolutionary developmental, developmental biology, regulatory uh, genomics, transcriptomics, and many other things. Um, he is affiliated with computer science, integrated genetics genomics, um, molecular cell and integrated physiology at UC Davis, and interested in omics data analysis, gene expression, and gene regulatory networks, um, and so on. So it's our great pleasure to have Titus Brown um, speaking to us. And the, one of the many reasons why we are interested in that is the West Coast Metabolomic Seminar is part of the Common Fund or the NIH Common Fund program, um, as well as, you know, we are also a part of the pain Consortium, which is also part, uh, also funded by the common funds, and so we always wondered about where do our data go, and what happens to our data once they have left our laboratory, and how can we ever, ever f see them again, and maybe even reuse our data, um, or enable other people to do the same. So, Titus, uh, tell us how to do it. <laughs> All right, um, I uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna look at. Stephen at, at Fringy's uh, um, Zoom picture to make sure you can hear me, Fringy, and you can see my slides. We can see everything, and I can hear you just fine, Titus. Excellent, great. Okay, um, so uh, so first, let me just say thank you to for the invitation. This is actually my first um, fully remote uh, in pandemic talk, so uh, I'm excited to see how this goes. <laughs> and uh, right, so today I'm going to be talking about software and data for all how we are working with the NIH Common Fund to increase data reuse. And as you can see, I have a lot of affiliations. Um, and so I wanted, I think, uh, let's see, there we are. Oliver did a, a great job of introducing me. Um, I'll just say that my main focus is on sequencing data analysis. Uh, and in particular, that means that I think a lot about data reuse because usually I'm talking with people that, that are working in areas of biology that I don't work in. My background's in developmental biology and microbiology, but I also work broadly across biomedical data science. Um, and so I'm usually working with data sets that I didn't produce and that I wasn't even aware of until I got involved in a collaboration. Um, as part of this, my meta focus uh, for the last 15 years, and this is what uh, um, Oliver referred to as not real science, is ways to improve science through uses of things like open science and open source as well as what I think of as socio-technical approaches to improving science training, community engagement, social media, uh, you know, basically all of the things that we actually rely upon but that nobody ever directly funds. All right, so my goals for this talk, um, and I wanna be really upfront and clear uh, in the hopes that, that people will, will, will get something out of this talk uh, and that I'll get something out of this talk. Um, the first is, is I, I wanted to, to put forward a coherent and, and hopefully interesting presentation about what this common fund data ecosystem is doing and how everybody on this, um, uh, on this call, on this teleconference, can be involved in terms of being users or members. And there's no cost to being involved uh, other than your, your comments and attention, so, which is a significant cost, admittedly. But, but, so that's my first goal. Um, I also really want to learn what the audience wants to know that I didn't say. So. Um, I would really appreciate feedback. I'll tell you a little bit about how to give feedback in a little bit. I think there are a lot of potential future users out there that I uh, that we are unaware of. Uh, and then sort of the more general thing, and this is where a lot of my social media strategies come in, is that I really want to enable, I really want to identify missed opportunities for strategies and approaches in the Common Fund data ecosystem. Um, that having been said, you know, I'm going to give you a perspective that's heavily sort of socio-technical. How do people engage with technology? How do we, how do we change science for the better to, to um, increase the speed of both research and clinical translation. 
Um, so, um, you know, this is only one perspective. I'd love to know what, what it is you think that I've missed. What didn't make sense? What's, uh, what's on your mind? Okay, so I'm gonna try to keep this talk well under an hour. Um, we all have many, many, many Zoom meetings these days. Um, Amanda Charbonneau, uh, who is on, uh, who's available on Zoom, will help moderate. If you have questions that, that come up as you're hearing me talk, please just send them to Amanda. And then every five to 10 minutes, I'll stop for questions and Amanda and others can interrupt and say, hey, there's this question and so on and so forth. Um, I've made the slides available just now. They're available if you Google Titus Brown talks and osf.io. Amanda, if you um, feel up to it and you can find the talks and you wanna post them on Twitter with this hashtag NIH underscore CFDE, that would be great. And you're more than welcome to tweet this talk. Um, uh, and um, I look forward to, to hearing from you. Okay, two quick caveats. Um, I'm gonna say some inaccurate things. In particular, it turns out I know nothing at all about metabolomics. Please do correct me. I'm, a, I'm, a robust, I'm robust to uh, corrections and I love new information. Um, and I'm hoping to give these kinds of talks in the future, so it would be nice to give them more accurately. Um, the other thing is, is something that comes up a lot on Twitter and it's a sort of notion of sort of context collapse and other things where there's a lot of initiatives out there around data reuse, both within the NIH uh, um, and across biomedical research, research overall and internationally. And um, we don't know about all these initiatives, so we'd love to hear about them. Um, what that also means is that if, you're, if you think there's an initiative that's incredibly relevant that I'm not mentioning, odds are pretty good that it is incredibly relevant and we just don't know about it. So we would love, we would love to, to know more about these initiatives. Okay. Here's some information on how to contact me and us. Uh, you can hit us up on Twitter. Um, uh, I'm C. Titus Brown. There's also the NIH underscore CFDE Twitter account. Uh, you can email me, I'm easy to find. There's only so many Tituses out there. Uh, and then there's links for contact information and so on at this uh, URL, nih-cfde.org. All right, so outline of the talk. So I'm gonna start by giving you a high level perspective on what the common fund is. I'm gonna talk a little bit, then I'm gonna move on and talk in a different section about what the goal of the common fund of data ecosystem is. I'm gonna talk about metabolomics and the metabolomics, the National Metabolomics Data Resource Center. Uh, and then I'm gonna also talk about some common challenges that we've discovered across the common fund. Uh, and then at the very end, just give you some points about meta challenges and, and future, future directions. So I'll take, I'll have room for questions. Actually, why don't I stop right now? Uh, I see that there was some chat comment. Let me see if there are questions. Uh, Amanda, anything I should be aware of? It was just me posting a link to the slides. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. There's a tactic you use for taking questions when you're doing teleconferencing or teaching, which is you wait until the science, be the silence becomes uncomfortable. So I will do that uh, in future, in future option, op, um, question periods. Okay. So so what is the Common Fund? So the NIH Common Fund, this is a quote from their website, the NIH Common Fund is a unique resource at the NIH functioning as a venture capital space where high-risk innovative endeavors with the potential for extraordinary impact can be supported. Um, what, another way, the way that I tend to introduce it to people, if you're familiar with DARPA, which is sort of the, the fast-moving wing of um, the DOD for investigating cool new things that might or might not have, have really cool potential, um, the NIH Common Fund is sort of that for the biomedical uh, uh, research field. Um, basically, and um, I wasn't aware of the Common Fund when it was being created, but basically um, the NIH is divided into many different institutes and those institutes tend to be disease focused. So for example, there's um, NIDDK, uh, which does kidney and other research. There's um, NAAID, infectious disease. There's uh, N uh, NCI, the Cancer Institute. And those tend to be fairly siloed around specific diseases or, or specific uh, efforts like the NHGRI for human genome research. And um, the Common Fund is an attempt to sort of help break out of those silos by funding things that are potentially cross IC or for data types that aren't really um, uh, well understood yet. In particular, for example, metabolomics has the mandate of the Metabolomics Center has the mandate of increasing the use of metabolomics across the NIH. So it fits within the common fund. So there's a lot of CF programs. I put the first couple here on this slide, but in ter if you zoom all the way out and you try and fit it all in one slide, there's somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to 30 
There's about 15, I believe, that are active and relevant to what we're doing right now. There's some that are sunsetting. There are some that are sunrising. It's a constantly changing dynamic um, uh, landscape of, of programs. Um, and, and the main thing for the purpose of this talk is that the Common Fund is actually a really major source of data. Um, depending on where you come from, uh, what fields you're interested in, uh, you've probably, if you work in genomics like I do, you've probably heard of GTEx, which is a human tissue atlas. Uh, and um, it contains uh, tissue ex uh, RNA-seq expression values for um, data sets for many different normal human tissues. Um, HubMap, uh, for example, is another data set that is another program that's generating single cell data across um, the human body. HMP and IHMP are the Human Microbiome Project. 4D Nucleome is looking at uh, um, the, the, the time varying structure of the human nucleus. The Kids First data, uh, the Kids First program is looking at pediatric oncology and structural birth defects in kids. Um, Lynx, Metabolomics, Motor Pack is, uh, is looking at how things change when um, you do, you, at how gene expression and metabolomes change as you undergo exercise. Uh, Spark is looking at the peripheral nervous system and interconnectivity there. So it's a really wide range of things. And all of these programs are generating many interlinked data sets of many types. Everybody's doing transcriptomics because RNA-seq is easy, um, uh, relatively speaking. Many are doing proteomics. Many are doing metabolomics. Uh, a lot of them have clinical data associated. So there's just this sort of vast array, this matrix of data across all of these different um, programs, as well as, as across a variety of different, uh, I'm not sure what the right word is, um, scopes. So you can see on the right side of this figure, uh, motor pack is looking at systems and organs, Spark as a Spark, HubMap is looking at organs and cells, Links and the rest are all looking at molecules as well as some are looking at cells. So you have this sort of vast array of data for many different, with many different points of connectivity between the different um, common fund programs. Another unique feature, relatively unique feature of the common fund within the NIH is that these programs have, I believe, a congressionally mandated 10 year limit. And what that means is that um, from the moment funding is awarded until the moment funding ends, you have a 10 years. Usually it's divided into two phases, the first phase and the second phase. And there's can be a competitive renewal. For example, 4D Nucleome is going through a competitive renewal right now um, for the various components of the project. These projects can change substantially in the middle. So for example, HMP underwent uh, a, a shift in, in around 2015 from looking at general characterization of the microbiome across healthy humans to a very much more specific focus on diabetes, um, preterm, pregnancy, and I've just forgotten the third one, which is still, it's the mm -hmm. one I work on, which is uh, inflammatory, inflammatory bowel disease. I'm giving a talk on that on Monday, so I should have remembered that. Thank you, Mena. Okay, so, so this actually introduces some interesting limitations because um, within 10 years, these programs will lose their funding, will lose opportunities for sustainability of data, and will have to find sort of a new home within the NIH if they plan to continue. So we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a few slides. Okay, so um, sort of in summary, the Common Fund has an increasing amount of reusable data, many opportunities for cross NIH data integration, even within the Common Fund, but also across other, other uh, institutes, many challenges to data reuse that we'll cover a little bit of. And I would say that the Common Fund is really particularly challenging because of its interdisciplinary and its focus on new and emerging data types. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but. Um, you know, within the realm of bioinformatics, I would say that analyzing RNA-seq, bulk RNA-seq, is actually fairly straightforward at this point. You can, you, you can get the data from a facility, you can download it, there are programs that will work with it. Many of the challenges around, for example, um, batch effects and so on are well understood, if not always um, properly handled, and, and it's a pretty robust field at this point. As opposed to, for example, single cell sequencing or metabolomics, where there's still an aspect of the Wild West where the pipelines aren't always well defined. There's a lot of instrument and protocol specific components. The bioinformatics tools are rapidly, rapidly changing. And um, it's, uh, it's, this is the common fund lives in this space. So it's really, it's really been a fascinating and enlightening two years of, of work as we, as we work to understand what's going on. Okay, so at this point I'll, I'll pause for 10 or 15 seconds and see if anybody has any questions about sort of the common fund overall. Okay, I see some chat questions. 
Um, so uh, do common fund data have any user restrictions? Um, so basically it comes down to the specific types of data. Uh, let me see if I can go back to the slides here. So for example, um, uh, I'll give an example of a robust uh, project that, that has been dealing with this for a long time, uh, GTEx. Uh, GTEx has, um, provides uh, bulk RNA-seq and you can, with appropriate dbGaP um, authorization, download the raw data, which includes the variants that are, are identifiable. But GTEx can also provide, does in fact also provide um, a public interface where you can explore gene expression profiles, which are tissue specific, but not personally identifiable. So there's a whole spectrum. HMP, for example, screens, uh, you take, um, deals with gut microbes, among other things, sorry, human, human microbiota generally, but they tend to, they screen out human data and they make the microbial data available because that's generally not personally identifiable. Um, but then they also have a whole large component of metadata that needs to be brought in to understand um, the, uh, it needs to be brought in for context. And that then is personally identifiable and needs to, you need to go through dbGaP authorization in order to get that. Um, one other quick comment uh, that came up um, from Fringy was the All of Us program. I'm not actually sure that's a common fund program. Um, if it is, we're not engaged with it. <laughs> uh, but I'm pretty sure that's a pan NIH program. I don't know where it lives. It probably lives within the office of the director, but not under the common fund. All right, so um, I'll move on. Um, Amanda, anything else? I haven't seen anything. Great, thank you. Okay, so, so I've told you about the Common Fund. Now I wanna tell you a little bit about what it is that we're doing. So the Common Fund data ecosystem is this nascent effort, and by that I mean it's less than two years old. And our goal is to help identify, explore, and help these Common Fund programs, both the past, present, and the future ones, expand their, their reusability and actual data reuse of, their, of the data they generate. And I should say that, that um, this is an increasing mandate of the Common Fund. In the past, for example, the HMP was largely funded to produce reference catalogs and so on that could inform future data collection efforts. Uh, and the IHMP in particular, um, a lot of the data was largely intended for intra-consortium use. That has started to change. For example, HubMap has an explicit goal of producing the data uh, for all. Uh, GTEx has always had that goal, for example. Um, and so as the common fund and data reuse and data generation capacities change their focus, uh, data reuse is becoming a bigger and bigger part. So what, what the CFD is, uh, is a network of data sets and data managers. And our goal is to work together to advance science by making these data sets more useful, both alone and in combination. More useful alone would mean, for example, that um, we are working to, we're working with, for example, GTEx to expand the ways that their data sets can be used only within GTEx, with the context of GTEx and perhaps private data sets. In combination, you'll see, you'll see an example of this later, is the gene expression in specific human tissues can be, in GTEx, can be combined with uh, metabolomics information to, to link genes and pathways together. And that would be an example where two common fund data coordinating centers would actually need to uh, collaborate. The two primary components of the CFDE are the coordinating center, which I'm part of, and the data coordinating centers themselves. Typically, each common fund program has at least one, sometimes a dozen, up to a dozen data coordinating centers or data resource centers that are charged with uh, curating and making the data available together with analysis pipelines. And these DCCs are, are viewed as key stakeholders and partners in, in the larger effort of the CFDE. Uh, so the NIH vision for the CFDE is to make data sets more discoverable and shareable, and, uh, whoops, make, uh, um, enable users to combine assets from across different data coordinating centers, and enable analyses on data, DCC computing platforms. Um, I, I should just say, like, before we move on, this is an incredibly big challenge that's being faced by all avenues, all, all areas of science across the board. Uh, it's what's called a wicked problem. Um, problems of data reuse and data availability and analysis really fall into this general category of just in, in, really intractable challenges where um, I, I don't want to recite every component of a wicked problem, but you know, there's no clear problem definition. 
they're, they're multi-causal, multi-scalar, and interconnected. There's many stakeholders. They all have conflicting agendas. Solutions are not, not right or wrong, but better and worse. Problems are never completely solved. So um, this is very much a Gordian knot kind of situation that's probably familiar to people that have been talking about open data and open science uh, and data reuse and software and data generation for a long time. Um, so uh, the CFDE structure to tackle this wicked problem is really divided into sort of four components. We have an overall coordination center at the University of Maryland that's headed by Owen White. We have a training coordination center that's just getting started this year that uh, myself and Amanda Charbonneau are, are running. We have an engagement team that consists of um, my group here at UC Davis, uh, people from Owen White's group at Maryland, and um, RTI, which is a technology uh, development company on the East Coast in North Carolina. Uh, there's a project management team. It turns out coordinating all the moving parts, both with internally and across the data coordinating centers, requires a lot of uh, effort. And so Amanda is heavily involved in that, along with uh, Bob Carter, Jenny Tree, and Michael, actually, Otieri at the NIH. And then there's a big tech coordination center with Ian Foster, Owen White, Avi Mayan, uh, Carl Kesselman, Susanna Sanson, and RTI. And these are the folks that are involved in implementing technical coordination components across the Common Fund. And I'll tell you a little bit more about what those are. So my primary focus is really on engagement, training, and project management. Um, okay, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll answer that question at the end. Great, okay. So um, the NIH vision for the CFD is, is, as I said before, make these data sets, assets more discoverable, enable combining assets, and then enabling analysis on DCC computing platforms. But there's a very key component, and this is related to um, sort of the slowly revising or maybe rapidly revising NIH focus on speeding up clinical research. Um, and I actually, I think I might have had to justify this more like pre-pandemic, but nowadays with the vast uh, amount of data um, coming from all directions to help with the coronavirus situation, you can sort of see the, the, the time it takes to do clinical trials and so on. To just do basic discovery could, um, is, is really, can be really critical and important for dealing with diseases. So, Sorry. So we have a story that we came up that we discovered when we went and visited the Kids First, the Gabriella Miller Kids First program, uh, where the Data Resource Center is hosted at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. So Kids First was contacted by a doctor. This doctor, uh, I believe the doctor was in Europe. Um, this is about two years ago. And they, this doctor said, look, we have a patient uh, looking at the tumor. Um, the, the tumor type looks like an adult tumor for which there is a therapy that targets a specific uh, transcript, a specific, um, just forgotten the word, uh, recombined transcript. Um, and uh, we need to know if in this tumor type across your database, this fusion transcript, there we are, it tends to appear. Because if it is, if it does, we know that's the target of this clinical therapy. And we can, uh, we can enroll this patient in a clinical trial that may save their life. And I should say here that pediatric um, tumors tend to be very fast acting, and life expectancy typically is measured in, um, in, in six to nine months, for example, for DIPG. So the idea of enrolling a patient very quickly in clinical trials is, is very attractive when you're treating these, these patients. So the Kids First staff, within approximately 24 hours, they compared the patient's transcriptome to variants hosted in their own database, reviewed those results with the GTEx information to make sure that in the normal tissue type from which this tumor originated, uh, in um, this fusion transcript did not exist, got back to the clinician with that information who then enrolled the cancer patient in that additional trial. Um, we don't know how the story, we, 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 um, we don't know how the story ended, but at the very least, this kind of rapid turnaround, data informed, but also clinically involved, is something that we want to enable. So you might go like, okay, well, um, that, that doesn't sound so difficult, so why can't everybody do that? It turns out that Kids First knew that this was the kind of analysis that would need to be done. It was a very common use case when they, um, uh, among their own clinical practitioners. So they spent the months to years of pre-processing the GTEx data to match it with the data in the Kids First program so that it was ready to compare results at sort of a button push. This required really significant advanced planning as well as um, really substantial point of response bioinformatics expertise. So how do we enable that across the common fund. And it turns out that basically um, 
I, and I don't, you know, I'm sort of jumping into this, but it turns out that just making the data available in a cloud so you can download the raw data doesn't make that data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, fair as we would term it. Um, even if the data were available, most researchers, most biomedical researchers who have the clinical ability to look at the data and make decisions about it and interpret it will lack the skills, help support, and computational power to use those data sets. So that sort of is the medium term charter of what the Common Fund Data Ecosystem is hoping to help with, one of our charters. So how are we going to do this? So we've spent about a year and a half now doing this um, engagement strategy. And this is a, a really open-ended approach. It's actually quite different from the way a lot of NIH programs um, move forward. Uh, it's essentially, it's in, in essence, a very socio-technical approach. We went and we visited nine data coordinating centers in 2019. Uh, and we sat down with them for two days each. And we did what was called what we call the deep dive. We basically said, uh, introduced ourselves at the beginning. We said, you know, we don't have an agenda beyond wanting to know what it is you do. And then we spent a day with them just exploring what their mandate was, what data types they're generating, how they were storing it, how they were making it available. These were all experts. These are all experts within their specific fields. The GTEx folk, you can't get much better than them at producing RNA-seq and making it available with, with amazing visualization interfaces. Um, and so we wanted to understand what they were currently doing. And then we took a lot of notes. And then the second day we said, okay, well, here's what we found from talking to other people that are doing similar things at other data coordinating centers in the Common Fund. And we tried to link up across the, C the Common Fund and say, you know, these people could use RNA-seq visualization. These people have really cool tutorials. These, these people have a really innovative a pipeline execution approach and so on and so forth. And then over the next 18 months, we engaged in a multiple times around problems specific to each data coordinating center and tried to identify intra and inter DCC efforts that would help uh, move the needle. And that's where we are sort of right now. So one particularly cool thing. So this was, this was pretty much my 2019. Uh, Amanda and Owen and I visited all of, along with, with um, some uh, people from the tech team and engagement team, visited nine different data coordinating centers across the entire US. And we wrote it all down. Uh, so we've actually produced three different uh, reports, um, a July report, an October report, and a December report. Um, these reports contain, uh, are, contain deep dive reports, generally in the neighborhood of 10 to 15 pages, on nine different common fund programs, GTEx, HMP, Metabolomics, Kids First, and so on. They, contain, uh, they also contain a very, hopefully, very readable summary report and a bunch of figures. And uh, if you want to know more about what it is a particular common fund data coordinating pro, uh, center is doing, you can go read these reports and pretty much just do your keyword search and find a bunch of really fascinating information. On the flip side, we may have too much detail. <laughs> so uh, this is um, from the December CFDE report. You can see that we, we put about 15, 14 pages of summary in, and then we had 15 to 20 pages for each deep dive for 40 nucleome, metabolomics, and motor pack. So this is a lot of information. So in practice, what we tend to do is um, uh, go through repeated rounds of summarization and um, uh, conceptual extraction, and then go back into the deep dives to figure out which programs could use which particular uh, type of support. So what did we find? So this is just a very brief summary um, of lots and lots of information, but Basically, we found that they were, uh, there were a lot of life cycle, life cycle challenges. Uh, for example, funding was often dropped into an existing or mature consortium. There were decisions in short timeframes. There was a general absence of guidelines on how to establish one of these data coordinating centers. So, sorry, moving back to the first step, typically what happened is, for example, for the HMP, they would fund a bunch of people to do data generation. And then after that, they would fund people at the data coordinating center and sometimes data analysis center. And so basically, uh, an existing large body of data would be suddenly presented to um, a newly funded DCC, and the DCC would be expected to deal with this, with this very quickly. In the middle of the life cycle, there were many challenging community behaviors. For example, data release and shepherding metadata is really challenging. Uh, and then continuous mandate creep. Basically, and this is, this is actually an awesome feature of the Common Fund, and they've evolved ways to deal with it. But they didn't pretend that when they gave someone five years of funding that they knew what that program needed to do in advance. So as new ideas came along, they would increase, they would say, hey, how about doing this? Or, hey, um, GTEx, now that we've funded this uh, single cell 
effort. HubMap, you should be talking with them, or Metabolomics, you should be talking with them. This, this is sort of a form of mandate creep, and it's great when it comes with funding, but of course it doesn't always come with funding. At the end of the life cycle, you run into massive problems with sustainability, data retirement, final storage. Um, I think it's, it's in the report, so I'll just, it's probably okay to say like, HMP sort of came about before the cloud was really big. And so there's a lot of challenges around uh, where, their, where their data is living. Uh, and so for a while, there was the fear that the data would be sitting inaccessible on server racks that were no longer funded to be operated or maintained or backed up. And so uh, as part of the CFD, we've actually been able to get funding to move HMP data into modern pipelines running on the cloud. Um, standardized data tracking and, and, and global unique identifiers. There's lots of software and pipelines that are developed for each of these DCCs that, that expertise is then lost at the end of the life cycle. There's just a lot of resources that are developed during these programs for which there's no funding available afterwards. Um, fair metrics and standards. There's really no unified set of practices for findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reusability. Implementation details really vary widely. Despite this, all of the DCCs are incredibly committed to FAIR, but we're trying to figure out how to help coordinate. Um, turns out it's just hard to find data sets. Metadata harmonization is an ongoing challenge. There's no single catalog by which you can search by all these different uh, features that you're interested in. Um, authentication is a challenge. Uh, there's no single sign-on system for the NIH that can that's you access protected data that's tied to IRBs and, and data access approvals. Not everything's even in dbGaP. Um, one of the biggest things we came across is who pays for analysis. So it turns out that you know as data set data size data set sizes increase, compute costs can just become absolutely monstrous. So even with volume discounts that the NIH can negotiate with, with uh, Amazon and, and Google, who pays for the analysis needs to be answered. Is it the NIH via grants? Is it the NIH via internal analysis programs? Is it whoever's doing the data has to apply for the grants for their own data analysis components? Is there direct support from the DCCs? How do you deal with international collaborators? Basically, how do you enable a wide range of flexible analysis systems that permit anybody with money to analyze them and permit people who have good ideas to also analyze the data, to spend the, the spend money to analyze the data. Um, I have two, two, or three more two or three more slides and then I'll take some questions. Training and user support is a massive common challenge. Very few DCCs have a training mandate or any support for training. Turns out in biomedical data science, we don't, in biomedicine, we don't do a great job of talking about and training in data analysis. So um, the scope becomes far too broad for any one DCC. Uh, GTEx, for example, periodically gets queries that range from, hey, I was looking at this particular data set with this particular protocol for analysis and I noticed this weird feature, what do you think? To, hey, um, how do you analyze RNA-seq? Because I really would like to. And, and that's, just too, that, that's just too broad a, a question for, um, for one DCC to answer. Coordination challenges. What standards do we adopt? Who hosts the catalog or a catalog? What kind of evaluation metrics are provided to the NIH around data reuse and by whom? Uh, and so our, our point here is that, that we really need a central player that's not focused on a specific common fund program and can hopefully help drive consensus and adoption of, of standards and so on across the common fund. Okay, I'm gonna pause on this slide and take some, and, and look at the questions now. Uh, I'm, actually, I'll just ask Amanda. Amanda, what should I, where should I start? The uh, only question so far, um, has been, does CFDE advise on generational differences in data creation, like new techniques, materials, as new data are added? Hmm. So uh, I would start by saying, um, we're not, uh, no, we're not the data, we're not the data type specific experts in general. I mean, we have a lot of, in the CFDE, we have a lot of expertise in specific areas. I would argue that we're, my lab's pretty good at bioinformatics data and at, at sequencing data analysis. Um, Owen White's group is, was the HMP or hosts the HMP Data Coordinating Center. They have experts on human microbiome data. In general though, what we have found is that the people generating the data, the people within these consortia tend to be the absolute experts. So we're more interested in, in finding out what they're doing and why and sharing it broadly, which they're already excellent at, but we're interested in sharing it broadly for sort of very operational and functional purposes um, than we are in coming up with new, uh, with new approaches or new um, techniques. 
That having been said, I think that inevitably there's going to be a lot of interplay as we learn to do metadata better, as we learn to, to do FAIR better, as we learn to do data analysis and training better. We're hoping that there will be information flow in both ways. Like, oh, users are really having a tough time with this particular data presentation approach. Maybe as a DCC, you could investigate this other approach that this other DCC has used. Okay. Um, so one of the resources has really good tutorials. Um, it's a good question. Uh, which one would I? You know, GTEx has produced some amazing tutorials and webinars, and they're working on new ones in coordination with us. Uh, the same is true for Kids First, which has been working in this area. So I would say at the moment, um, the, probably the, the one with the most, the, the Common Fund Center that has the most tutorials and training material is actually Lynx, which is looking at um, uh, cell line responses to drugs. Um, so Lynx would be the place, the first place I would go. Um, if different Common Fund programs create the same type of data, say RNA-seq, would the DCCs of those CF programs collaborate towards common standards? Absolutely. Yes, that's, that's one of our goals. That having been said, there is a challenge. Um, you don't want premature convergence on standards because that tends to limit innovation. So um, what we really want to do is, uh, what we really want to do is figure out where convergence on analysis approaches and data standards has already happened, broadly speaking. Sometimes that will have happened, often that will have happened outside of the common fund. For example, HubMap is looking at single cell sequencing data uh, and they're working to collaborate with the Human Cell Atlas, which is a, a broad multinational consortium um, that has its own set of standards and they're looking to converge those standards. And if you can find a set of standards that HCA and HubMap, HubMap in the common fund and HCI globally agree on, then that makes sense for us to sort of instantiate as, hey, if you're generating single cell data, go ahead and use this. In the metabolomics world, one of the challenges you seem to run into, and I am not an expert, is simply that different um, protocols, different hardware, different software, um, different analysis pipelines haven't fully been standardized yet. So there's a lot of um, convergence that has yet to happen there. That's, that was our experience. That was our um, discussion. You can read a little bit more about that in the motor pack um, report, which I believe is I don't know, it's either in the October or the December report. Ah, um, another question. Why is a CFTE solution to avoid download egress charges? Um, what does that mean? So, um, sorry, I should have defined that. So um, it turns out that for a variety of reasons, the cloud com companies like Amazon, the cloud hosting companies like Amazon and, and Azure, Amazon Web Services and Azure and Google Compute, encourage you to upload your data to them so they can store it and charge you for the storage. That's fine, the, the, the storage charges are relatively reasonable. What they discourage is you taking the data out of their uh, data centers. That's not so big a problem if you're talking about spreadsheets or PDFs or whatever. It turns out to be a big problem when you're talking about um, terabytes or petabytes of data. I don't have the numbers in my head at the moment, but for example, to download I, the version eight of the GTEx data, it costs approximately $10,000. It's hosted in the Google Compute Cloud. If you wanted to download it to your local computer, your local HPC to analyze there, assuming you had access, it would cost you $10,000 to do that download. And that's partly just because that is a lot of data. <laughs> so um, it's actually reasonable to charge some amount of money for, for downloading it due to network fees. Um, and there's also business decisions. So what we've been working towards what the NIH in general has been working towards for several years, first as part of the data commons pilot phase consortium, and then as part of the common fund data ecosystem within the, within the common fund, but also many other institutes and centers, has been this idea that the data will live in the cloud and you will do computation on the data proximal to it in the cloud on computers that are cloud computers. This has a lot of attractive components. One is that you can actually potentially do a much better job of um, of restricting access to, to human subjects, to, to privacy data, to private data. Uh, you have far more burst resources available in the cloud than at most institutes. And overall, it's just a strategy that the NIH is um, moving towards. The challenge is that right now, everybody's used to downloading the data to their HPC to analyze it. And so the toolkits and approaches that, that would enable data analysis in the cloud don't really exist, or sorry, 
are still young, and importantly, people don't know how to use them. I would point you towards Terra and Seven Bridges genomics platforms as examples of platforms that do data analysis in the cloud. DNA Nexus is another one. Um, but uh, um, a lot of people don't know how to use those yet, so that's one of our training efforts. Um, I'm going to ignore uh, Oliver's other question. Uh, wouldn't it be good if different CF programs produce the same type of data to run more round robin tests? I think that would make sense. It's something that we would have to propose within the Common Fund data ecosystem or as pairwise interactions between the DCCs. Um, so uh, questions on university level introduction to DCC data sets. Um, we, we don't know we don't know much about how these CF data sets are used in, in any aggregate sense. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence. For example, GTEx is, I think, the second most downloaded data set in dbGaP. Um, and, uh, um, you know, we would like to figure out a way to quantify that. Uh, universities do not have free ingress or egress traffic rules, I'm afraid. Some of them have inexpensive ones. For example, UC Davis has an agreement with Amazon, I believe, for the West Coast uh, that we can download data from from the Pacific Northwest region of Amazon at a low fee. Um, so it's a great question. Uh, there's another great question. How about downloading subsets of data resources from the cloud to encourage development of new data analysis and visualization pipelines? This is one of my favorite points. Thank you. So um, um, a number of, of the questions about data egress come from groups that need to operate across all of the data. Relatively few people need to recompute across 10, 10 terabyte, ten thousand dollars worth of data, or you know, eighty terabytes of data, or whatever it is. The ones that do tend to be groups like my lab that are generating novel data analysis approaches and novel visualization pipelines. Um, and I think I'm going to hand wave, and then I'll take I'll take skeptical comments on Twitter or or here uh, for later consideration. I'll just say that that my ideal situation would be that when you that the funding you get to generate to, to do development of data analysis and visualization pipelines would include money for the data egress or for doing the analysis in the cloud the challenge is that this then limits um uh clever scientists who are just assistant professors for example uh one of the big problems i ran into as an assistant professor was not having money to do this kind of thing it limits the creativity that new that postdocs and, and assistant professors without a lot of funding can apply to these kinds of data sets. So I would love to see very easy to get pilot grants from the NIH for uh, data resource access and co computation that would be potentially even independent of or would come with a small postdoc uh, stipend. Um, but uh, these are proposals that we're, we're ho hoping to help the NIH develop. And I have no, um, I would just say I would be enthusiastic about that kind of thing, but we don't. We don't have any information on that yet. Uh, the Bio Data Catalyst Group has done something like this. Um, they're hosted out of Rensi, North Carolina. And if you email us or Slack us, or sorry, or um, message us, we can get you some information on some of those calls. All right. Hopefully that wasn't too rapid shotgun on the questions. OK, so I'm going to talk fairly briefly about metabolomics. Um, partly because I don't know that much about metabolomics, but um, uh, partly because I think I'm going to go over time as it is. So, um, so, so the metabolomics program, there's a metabolomics program within the Common Fund, and I believe that uh, the West Coast Metabolomics Center, which is hosting this talk, is part of that program. And this represents a dedicated effort to bring metabolite screens into more widespread use uh, by working to standardize methods, compound names, and analysis tools. So we sat down uh, with the National Metabolomics Data Repository at, in UC uh, in San Diego um, for uh, two days with uh, a bunch of amazing people. Shankar Subramanian, who's the PI. Um, I don't know how to pronounce Owen. I think it's Owen, Kenan, Andrew Caldwell, Chris Kirkpat Kirkpatrick, and Kevin Coakley to just talk with them about what it is they did. Um, so very briefly, the NMDR has an amazing web workbench excellent data findability, a large number of queries and data analysis scripts and pipelines that are all publicly available and executable by everybody, and then a lot of untapped opportunities for combining with other data sets. Um, so, uh, and you can read more in our report. This is sort of a summary, a high-level summary. And the thing that, that really came out 
uh, of the metabolomic site visit was that there were a lot of data integration opportunities, which makes sense. Metabolomics is a nice orthogonal type of data that gives, you know, uh, I think Oliver was the one who coined, who, who gave me this term, you know, the metabolome is life. So it makes sense if you can measure it, that that's what you should be looking at. Um, so the, the problem is that the metabolomics uh, center really only hosts the data and they don't necessarily interact with a lot of these other projects across the common fund and elsewhere. So our main question that came out of our site visit or one main question was, can we dig into the different data sets and find places where this data exists for body sites and disease states that are present in other data sets? So um, I'm gonna show you a, a very busy figure that's a prototype figure that, that Amanda developed as part of a presentation to the Common Fund. The central question was, if we ingest a bunch of data sets um, and ask how much data in GTEx can be correlated across DCCs by body site, what do we get? And the answer is that when you look at the three-way, I don't know if you, can you see my uh, mouse cursor, Amanda? Yeah. Excellent, cool. Um, when you look at uh, GTEx links, which looks at drug effects on, on um, cell cultures, and metabolomics, uh, data sets that are in the metabolomics based on, on body sites, you find actually 15 different data sets that come from the same body site that have multiple data sets within GTEx links and metabolomics. So that's pretty promising. And you can see for a bunch of other data sets, you know, for example, uh, um, uh, GTEx and links, GTEx and metabolomics and so on, uh, also have independently pairwise a bunch of things. There aren't that many across six different uh, DCCs. There are only two data sets for which GTEx, HMP, Lynx, Metabolomics, Spark, and 40 Nucleome have corresponding body sites, compared with a much larger set of, of data sets across all individually within the DCCs. So, so this is sort of promising and interesting. We haven't done much with this yet because we're, we're still sort of in the discovery phase, so to speak. But why can't we have a real-time view of this kind of thing? with links to the data sets and one click to compute environment functionality, one click to compute environment functionality that lets us say, I'm interested in this body site, give me the data, or I'm interested in these data types um, with their core, you know, any data set that has RNA-seq for this body site and any other data set that comes in from the same body set. And I want it all in one place in the cloud where I can work with it and have all my tools available to work with it. Um, sorry, let me just, let's see, chat. Uh, what does deviation mean from slide 42? I'm gonna to appeal to Amanda. Amanda, what does deviation mean here? Where are we even looking? Uh, it's the orange and blue. Um, ah, thank you. And uh, I would have to go and look to remember exactly. <laughs> I um, think if, if I had to put words in your mouth, I think that um, the card now that you used a pre-computed interface I did. And cardinality was what we were interested in. Deviation was something that we couldn't figure out how to get rid of on the, the yes. JavaScript view. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and look to see what it, what it um, corresponds to in this data. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We're still early, er, still early days, Keith. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So, so we, um, and, and my phrase, this is my phrasing. You can read the more, the better phrasing in the, in the report, but the NMDR folk made the point that, that really there's relatively little training on this, given the scale of metabolomics data that's available and being generated, there's relatively little training or exemplar analyses available for how to integrate this kind of data with many other data types. We're interested in, in doing that in my lab with the um, inflammatory bowel disease data sets that we've been downloading from the HMP and elsewhere. Um, it would be great if the CFDE could help uh, bring this need for training up to the NIH um, leadership and help fund more of it. So for example, uh, Oliver, there's a specific possibility that metabolomics could work with us to, to put forth fully funded training, new training programs on this to complement your existing training programs. Um, and then an interesting point that came up is that, uh, and it's hard to phrase this properly, but there's sort of a general lack of metabolomic science fiction. And what I mean by science fiction is all the cool things that you can do with metabolomics, just like all the cool things we can do with sequencing data. Um, uh, that information hasn't really been broadly spread in the scientific community. Um, and this was the view from the NMDR folk. So we think there might be an opportunity to do more in the way of brainstorming sessions, hacky fests, just bringing people in to common locations at universities and saying, 
here's what metabolomics data looks like. Here's the kinds of inferences you can get out of it. Here's what's available. Uh, let's explore together. Uh, and so that's something that we're, we're interested in doing. This turns out to be a general problem, I would argue, with, with um, biomedical data science. You tend to either have people that are expert in one particular type of data, like my lab can handle RNA-seq data and whole genome shotgun sequencing data, but we're not very good at, uh, most of us, I, there are some exceptions, we're not very good at interacting with the clinical phenotype data because we're not clinicians or, or MDs. Um, and I think there's an awful lot of opportunity for bringing people together from multiple different, uh, united around data types, but bring different people together to ask biological and clinical questions. So we're hoping to be able to do more of that. Okay, um, so what are the common quest challenges across the common fund? So there are some other challenges that came up. Uh, it turns out there are two basic classes of users that we need to serve with our data ingest pipeline. People want to know how much data is at kids first, how fast is it growing, how will it impact our budget, is it still being used? That's something program officers and program PIs want to know. End users have, have just as pointed a set of questions. Which sites have RNA-seq data sets? How much information can I find on kidney? Where is the data from the preterm birth study? And um, so what we've been putting some effort into is defining a common set of use cases. This, this is a, a sort of who wants to do what where that is needed for any kind of engineering effort. So for example, listing all the data sets hosted by Common Fund Program X would be one use case. A single CF program can host data for multiple projects, list all projects at CF Program X that have produced RNA-seq files. Generate statistics on geographical distribution of data usage. These are all individual use cases that we're trying to help the individual DCCs and collectively the Common Fund address with uh, technological development. So, uh, for example, an early stage data dashboard from some of our, um, that Rick Wagner uh, and the Jereva folk in Carl Kesselman's group put together um, that just shows different kind, you know, variety of data sets, um, files, and biosamples across different common fund program. This is a product of our common data in just pipeline. Something like this doesn't exist outside the common fund data ecosystem because uh, it has to be something that's developed by somebody who understands the different kinds of data types and how what to ingest. Data events? Um, so uh, data events are um, things like, well, the best example, I think, uh, do we have Kids First? Oh, we don't have this information from Kids First. The best example comes from Kids First. It's, um, we measured, we measured uh, blood uh, metabolome content at, at this doctor's visit, and then this doctor's visit, and then this doctor's visit with different treatments in between. So data events can be anything where you would maybe, think of it as perturbations. That's why Lynx has a number of them. Uh, we applied this drug before and after we got matched RNA-seq data sets or matched metabolomic data sets. So, um, so that's the kind of thing we want to enable, but in a programmatic way, in a well-defined way with good metadata harmonization. Um, we also see a lot of opportunity for sort of this bigger on-ramp where we have more researchers accessing the data. This is gonna be a challenge. There's portal implementations that need to be built. There's uh, training, there's observing and learning from user interactions. There's promoting harmonization across DCCs, across these data coordinating centers. Uh, and these are all things that users are gonna want, improved functionality for, and that we're hoping to help uh, um, define. Um, there's also a really interesting challenge. This is one of the slides that I um, had fixed up a little bit, but got deleted when my computer crashed. Apologies. Um, Future-proofing NIH uh, federation and interoperation. What we're doing within the Common Fund data ecosystem, with the Common Fund data ecosystem, within the Common Fund, isn't particularly unique in some sense across the, the um, NIH. I'd like to think that we have some pretty cool approaches. We have some great technology people. Uh, our engagement strategy is interesting. But basically, like, um, there are a lot of different ICs, institutes or centers, NHGRI, NHLBI, NCI, for example, that want to develop standards that can help other people use, they can help them interoperate with data across the NIH. The uh, Office of the Data Science, um, Office of Data Science Standards and something uh, that's also under the Office of the Director at the NIH is tasked with helping coordinate the standards development, but this will just take a lot of time. Um, so what we're going to be doing in the CFD is monitoring what international and NIH specific standards bodies are doing 
and helping bring that to the individual DCCs to spread the, the word and help with implementation of it, given that we're likely to have both a panoramic view of the standards, but also a really good view of what's going on within the, within the Common Fund specifically. And the hope is that at least the, the, the Common Fund programs can not ignore, but pay less attention to this than they otherwise would have to in order to make their data interoperable and federated. So uh, at this point, I'll stop for a little while and take some, take some questions. I think I only have, I think I'm basically almost over time, so I'm gonna finish pretty quickly after this, but I'll wait, I'll wait and see if there are any comments or questions. Okay, then I'll ask a, a quick question uh, myself, which is what are, what are the main challenges here? What we see as the main challenge is that Standards adoption is not something that an individual data coordinating center, standards creation is not something that an individual data coordinating center can undertake on their own. It's something that really has to be adopted at a community level. And so that's where we see an opportunity for the Common Fund data ecosystem and our efforts to spread, to spread those standards and enable adoption with some common technological approaches. So, um, okay. All right. Uh, last two slides, I'll just say, um, some meta observations, the data science world, it turns out, and this is an empirical statement from having talked to nine data coordinating centers, um, everybody uses a few common platforms. Virtually everybody is using either Python and Jupyter Notebooks or R and RStudio, sometimes R and Jupyter Notebooks. That's pretty cool. It means that if we can get all of the resources in the right place in the cloud at the right time, then people will generally have a few simple ways, relatively simple ways, interfaces for interacting with it. It'll either be Jupyter Lab or it'll be our studio. And that's actually, that's wonderful because it means that in terms of training end users, we're really only talking about two languages and, and we can provide a set of notebooks and analysis approaches that are essentially uh, transferable skills for, for people coming from other, other uh, areas. The other interesting thing, and this is very near and dear to my heart, is that the data science training world has really converged on uh, hands-on carpentry style training. This is the kind of thing that we do a lot of in my lab, where you essentially work through tutorials that give very specific use cases and, uh, and very specific motivation and outcomes that are tailored to individual fields. So for example, there's R for ecologists and you know, R for genomics and so on. And the, the way in which we do the training, the training that is needed to deliver the training, the instructor training, the materials, the, uh, even the, the videos and, um, uh, and closed captioning and multi-language translation is all increasingly standardized between our ladies and the carpentries and Anvil's training effort and so on to the point where we can start using each other's materials. So we're really hoping to take advantage of materials that other people have produced in this modality here. So that was pretty cool to discover. Um, in terms of next steps, I think the biggest next step is that uh, the NIH Common Fund is now providing multiple years of support to Common Fund projects that want to engage with the CFDE. Uh, the initial uh, funding for this, um, the initial period of application was a couple months ago. The initial collaborations will be announced in May 2020, uh, where there's going to be another round of funding opening up. We're hoping to be able to engage with the metabolomics groups on this front, both uh, the West Coast Metabolomics Center and the NMDR. Um, and uh, I think the main message here is the NIH is aware, the Common Fund leadership is aware that the CFTE will be asking for effort to be applied from different um, groups. Like we can't go to Oliver and say, hey, Oliver, we want to do training. Which of your people can work with us for free? We can put forward a joint plan where Oliver can get funding to support people to do and develop training materials along with other things to work with us. Uh, and those are, I think, the, the funding opportunity, um, which I don't think I linked here, but I can provide, uh, it's public, is uh, for three years of funding. So that's pretty exciting. Um, so at this point, I'll take questions. Uh, actually, you know what, I'm just going to skip forward. Acknowledgements. Uh, this is a, the CFDE team. Uh, I have not fairly represented what everybody is doing. Um, it's a group of amazing, wonderful people. Uh, Owen White is the lead. On the, on the award, Ian Foster of Argonne National Labs and Globus and University of Chicago, Avi Mayan of Mount Sinai, Carl Kesselman at USC, uh, Susanna Sanson at Oxford and Becky Boyles at RTI have all been um, amazing collaborators here. 
uh, Amanda Charbonneau uh, and Owen White um, came, um, have been amazing fellow travelers in the sense that we've been pursuing this, um, there's a polite version of this word, but I'm, I'm, I'm out of polite at this point in the talk, uh, the pipe dream of data interoperability on a common cloud platform for three years now. Uh, and uh, we had many setbacks and many frustrations. And um, I don't think any of us would be involved in this project if it weren't for the other two being involved. So that's been excellent. Uh, the NIH has consistently um, provided a long-term vision that uh, we're, we're trying to help them implement. Uh, and then they've also provided, of course, a lot of funding. So that's been great. Uh, please feel free to contact us, me or us, uh, and I'd be happy to take any questions. I don't see anything, anyone typing. Um, so I'll, I'll start with this comment about the training and the yeah. metabolomic science fiction. I love that. I yeah. love the words. And um, I know that the San Diego team is doing amazing systems biology because that's what Shankar uh, Subramaniam has been doing for a long time. Um, what do you think how metabolomics could be used for? What would you think that, what kind of science fiction, Science fiction comes from people who are not really knowing how to uh, travel between stars, but rather they think about what kind of aliens they would meet or so, right? Yeah. So uh, what would you think metabolomics could be good for? <laughs> so, so I have two, two guiding principles. Um, I'm, I'm going to not answer your question in a very specific way. I have two guiding principles. One is that I'm not that smart. So uh, I'd much rather enable other people to come up with the good ideas and then help them channel those ideas. The other guiding principle is that faculty are really good at, some faculty um, uh, are really good at vision. We have these data sets, we should be able to do amazing, exciting things with these data sets, we should be able to cure diseases. And then they write a grant, I can give you multiple examples, but I won't in public. They'll write a grant and they'll be like, okay, we're gonna do super cool things. And then, uh, they'll even get a grant and then their postdocs will be like, okay, but like we can't access the data. The data types don't mesh. The code, the statistical approaches for proper data integration don't exist. What, what the heck do we do? So to me, I think that the science fiction probably exists in the heads of people like you and, and Shankar. Um, the, the technology development for how to do it coming from the bottom up isn't yet there. Connecting the dots between the variety of different data sets and these sort of higher level science fiction doesn't exist. And there's two ways to, to, to advance, or at least two ways to advance that. One is to get some of that science fiction out of PI's heads and into NIH program priorities, right? To say, metabolomics is amazing. Look at all these data sets. Can we define five or 10, I definitely don't want to say moonshots, but can we define five or 10 questions that should be answerable by these, by, with the data sets that we have available? And then start to fund either individual postdocs or small groups ac across a wide range of, of um, institutions to attempt to answer this and get them to work together. This is essentially how bioinformatics evolved in a bottom-up way. There's a lot of different toolkits that are used without thought by people doing RNA-seq and whole genome shotgun. They were developed by many different people over the years, many different strategies. And you know, the clinical people, for example, just to go with coronavirus, the clinical people have always been thinking, or some of them have always been thinking, how can we use this to do tracking and tracing of infectious diseases? Separately, the, the, the technical community built all of the tools and approaches to do that. And now when an emergency comes along, we can actually do that. I'd like to see us build that capacity well in advance so that when, for example, Kids First comes along and says, we wanna know what the metabolome profile is of DIPG so that we can diagnose it very quickly with a small sample that you could just do that without having to go through a multi-year cycle. So I didn't really answer your question, but that's how I'm thinking. Yeah, yeah that's fine. You know, and that's, that's also how you would envision the training program, the interaction between common fund programs and the CFDE, like, like trying to get these use cases that you talked about, your carpentry use cases. Yeah. One way to do the interaction in the future. So, so I think it's definitely a multimodal effort and I'm a really big fan of, of the following approach. Um, you put together a tutorial, the tutorial's like 
let's look at differential expression and RNA seq between two developmental time stages of, uh, of of sea urchins, which is what I worked on for my grad work. And you get you get people in a room for three hours, and you run them through the hands-on tutorial, and you find out what questions they're asking. Because not most people aren't going to work on sea urchins, sadly. Right? They're awesome creatures, but most people don't work on them. So, but what you're telling people is like, here's roughly how like that kind of question can be answered, can be addressed using RNA-seq. But then you, you carefully do use case extraction in a sort of informal sense from the people based on the questions they're asking. And then you also have a brainstorming session after the tutorial where you say, what are the things you wanna work on and where, what are we missing in the training? And then you use that brainstorming session to both refactor the training iter iteratively so that it becomes more and more you know, appointed and answers the questions, but you also use it to, uh, to read, to, to iterate on the user interfaces and data set distribution approaches and software pipelines to improve them so that um, they become better attuned to the questions that users are actually asking. Uh, this is an approach that we've used with one of my, my lab's primary software outputs right now called SourMash. Uh, and it's, um, it's, it's amazing how well, like as the research developers of the software, we've been able to get a lot of use cases from users asking uh, in definitely in air quotes, dumb questions where they're like, why can't we do this? And we're like, well, you, you, you could, we just need to enable that. We never would have thought of some of those approaches. So there's a lot of wisdom of individual trainees. Nobody's gonna know the biological disease characteristics of a particular disease like the people that work on it. And we need to connect them to the people that have the data and the data analysis skills and put them in the same room. Um, I have many examples of this, but, but this is the kind of thing that we wanna do. All right. Uh, there is a question uh, from Keith. Um, what does CFTE consider about the difference between raw data and processed data and archiving and making raw data available for future processing analysis? Okay, so incredibly tendentious uh, challenge, incredible challenge. Um, what I would say is that you can imagine three different, uh, there's probably many more, but three different types of users. You can imagine the the person who has their own RNA-seq data set is gonna be probably 95% of biologists. They have an RNA-seq data set. They just want an answer uh, as to how in this particular disease, gene expression has changed in this tissue from, from over time, uh, from the disease versus healthy tissue. They wanna to go to GTEx, they wanna upload their own private data, they wanna compare it to GTEx, and they wanna get an answer. Um, that is not gonna require reanalysis of the GTEx data, which is in any case very large. So what they need to do is have access to the GTEx pipelines to analyze their own data and cross-reference it. That's probably 90 to 95% of the use cases that we see out there. And there's actually a bunch of efforts like that, like Recount and Recount2 already contain uh, their own version of the, pro of the processed GTEx data, which doesn't have human data, human subjects restrictions either. So it's great. There's another group of people that are going to be the serious hardcore statisticians who want to do large scale um, analysis and batch effect corrections uh, and and um, are looking at very specific kinds of, of subsets of samples and so on and so forth. They may need the raw data, or they may at least need a version of the process data that's not simply um, what GTEx provides. Uh, and then there's the methods developers, which overlap, of course, who are like, I have a cool new method for getting super ultra fast RNA-seq or super accurate RNA-seq data analysis done, and I need all the data. So our... I, I don't have a good answer. I'll just say that we see, okay, I'll, I'll be cal cold and callous. We see the biggest opportunity for growth, the biggest missed opportunities in bringing that data to the biological end users who are clinicians and, and people with very specific biological questions who quote, just need to, quote, just unquote, need to get an answer. The challenge there is that it's a whole spectrum. So very rarely can you just take a type of data and get an answer and move on and never look at that data again. How to deal with that is we have a great deal of experience with it in our lab and with training. I think it requires a broad-based training program and a training community. Ask me again in six months or privately via email and I can hand wave a bunch at you. But it's something that we want to enable across that entire spectrum. It's very hard, obviously. Um, I'll, I'll give a little shout out. So I have a I have an MD in my lab, Alicia Gingrich, who's getting a master's degree. She's interested in um, 
uh, dog immunotherapy. She's working on dog immunotherapy stuff. And um, she moved from, she generated her own data, did her own experiments, and then uh, sort of started to realize there was more to data analysis than she had initially thought as she, as she learned more over the two periods of her master's degree, and then started to dig into the underlying statistical assumptions and is now producing um, much more sophisticated and data, uh, what's the right word, data involved plots than she had initially thought she would. And now we're facing the challenge of how to communicate that to her research PI, because of course, saying the world is more complicated is an unsatisfactory research answer. So there's a lot of sort of, you move back and forth, right? Um, uh, between these different categories. And I think we have to allow for that and enable that at a technological level. All right, and if there are no, I don't see further written questions. If there are no further ad hoc questions by anyone, please. Otherwise, I, I find it very enlightening. Uh, we will continue to generate data in our center. Um, I can tell you one thing. Uh, it is not easy to upload the data to the Metabolomics Workbench. Yeah. Um, you, you said it's all amazing. And, and from our perspective, I'd say, uh-huh. <laughs> so, so in fact, if you look at our report, um, that is noted that a lot of their user support time, right, from the perspective of the DCC, a lot of their user support time is actually in uh, helping people up upload information. And, and that's, that's, so that's just the flip side of what you said, like, it's hard. And they know that. And uh, hopefully, maybe we can work with them to, to help improve that. All right. Uh, we look forward with you to engage in uh, training opportunities. We will hopefully have more emphasis on training in metabolomics. Um, we will host a symposium. That's for everyone. We host a symposium on biological interpretation of metabolomic data sets on September 4. We hope it will be in person, but maybe it will be online. Who knows? Right. We prepare for both events currently, or maybe a mixture of events where people are here and then there other people are elsewhere. <laughs> <laughs> we will see how that happens in the future. Thank you so much, Titus Brown, for your you. interesting webinar. Um, and everybody, enjoy your days. Have a great day, everybody. Bye. Thank you.